In mid-December 1944, Hitler launched his great gamble. For years now, the Germans had completely lost the initiative. The tone had constantly been set by the Allies and the Soviets ever since the disaster at Stalingrad. Now though, Hitler was willing to give it one last roll of the dice. No more would he react to events. Instead, he would attempt to write history himself or lose everything trying. The Allies had bled themselves white at the German frontier, despite the fact that Hitler had been hogging divisions specifically for this great offensive. He was gambling absolutely everything on this. If he struck now whilst the Allies were seemingly weak, then he could sweep them back into the sea. In his own words, the Führer stated that he planned to Dunkirk the Allies once more. This time though, the incompetent Luftwaffe would not be left to complete the job. If this great Ardennes offensive failed however, then Hitler openly admitted that the war would be lost, yet he had said this before and continued to fight. If the Allies landed in France, he had said, then the war would be over, yet the war was still continuing. In Romania, with regards to the Ployest oil fields, he said the exact same line, yet the war still carried on. Deep down, he must have known that the war was essentially lost by now, yet no matter how small the odds, he was willing to take them. The alternative was unimaginable. He clung to anything. Hitler was absolutely obsessed by Frederick the Great, whom had held on so staunchly in the Seven Years' War. Eventually, a change in monarch in Russia turned a hopeless situation into a glorious victory. Again and again, Hitler declared that the Germans must bear the pain and wait out a major historical event that would turn the tide. The super weapons, too, were a common favourite. To use these, however, he would need to hold off for a good while longer until they were ready for mass production. The reality was, the last realistic hope was his move in the Ardennes. If it failed, then the door would be open for the Allies into Germany, and inevitably, a rather fast collapse. It was all going to come to a head in 1945, if Hitler's health would even allow him to see out many more months. He was by now, in fact, dying of a heart condition amidst a dozen other health problems. The Führer was 55, but appeared more and more to be a man of 75 as each day passed. A few things before we begin. Firstly, this video is part of, and indeed, the last video in my almost 11 month long series on the life of Adolf Hitler. This video can very easily be watched on its own if you want to see how the last year of Hitler's life panned out. But if you'd like to start from the start, or get up to date, then the link to the playlist will be in the description, or displayed front and centre on my channel homepage. Secondly, a disclaimer. Adolf Hitler is quite rightly immensely controversial, but that doesn't mean this video needs to be. In no way, shape, or form is this video political, and it's purely a work of history, so please do not overthink it. Thank you. Lastly, a huge thank you to my Patreon, Subscribe Star, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. Without their kind support, I simply would not be able to do these videos for a living, and I cannot thank them enough, as it really is all down to them. So if you'd like to support the channel, join our Discord, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider signing up in one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps immensely. Thank you. The Ardennes Offensive had originally begun far better than anyone could have hoped. The Allied Air Force was grounded, and the utterly outnumbered defenders were quickly swamped beneath the tide of approaching Germans. As soon as the skies cleared though, everything changed. The over-motorised German divisions, stuck in traffic jams throughout the Ardennes, were simply bombed to pieces by the Allies. Many Germans quickly began to lose heart. Hitler, however, expressed confidence to those around him, despite the gloomy reality. With the loss of France and Belgium, German steel output was now slashed from over 3 million to 2 million tonnes. More worryingly, the new Mark 21 submarines, one of Hitler's upcoming superweapons, couldn't even get to the assembly points because of blown up canals. By November, only 9 had been assembled out of 17, and in December, only 18 had been assembled instead of 28. The air raids over Germany, too, had effectively halted submarine battery production. As for the offensive itself, Hitler had no answers. He attempted Operation North Wind to attempt to counter the oncoming American divisions, yet this caused nothing but a momentary panic for Eisenhower. The American at first suggested abandoning Strasbourg and other hard-fought ground, but quickly got a grip of himself, and the German counterattack came to nothing. In the east, too, the attempt to relieve Budapest fell short just outside the city gates. By the 3rd of January, Hitler came to his senses and cut his losses. His generals were telling him that they had now destroyed 1,230 Allied tanks in the battle and captured 400 guns. The reality, however, was clearly rather different. On the 7th at a conference with Goering and Rundstedt, Hitler openly admitted that his Ardennes gamble had failed. He decided to pull out Sepp Dietrich's entire 6th SS Panzer Army. The order went out at 2am on the 8th. It was categorically over in the Ardennes. Simply put, Hitler had been defeated by the enemy air superiority, as he had been every single time for years now. The Luftwaffe, as usual, simply had no answer. Meanwhile in the East, Stalin's grand offensive which had been speculated about for a long time now, simply had not come. On the 9th, Hitler said to Guderian, quote, 
If the Russians aren't attacking, then it's for political reasons, end quote. Guderian agreed, quote, it's because of the British, end quote. Hitler chose to believe that the Russians were allowing the Allies to bleed themselves out in the West, and that their alliance was crumbling. When it came to alternate strategies in the East, Hitler simply dismissed them out of hand. Quote, I always shudder when I hear talk of withdrawing here in order to operate there. I've been hearing that tune for two years now, and every time it's been a disaster. End quote. Hitler didn't fancy the Soviets' chances if they did decide to attack anyway. He had 3,000 tanks and assault guns out in the East. If Stalin were to succeed, he would need a 3 to 1 superiority in this regard, the Fuhrer reasoned. Quote, at any rate, they don't have 9,000 tanks, end quote. As for the men themselves, Hitler said that the Soviet divisions reminded him of what he called Chinese divisions, meaning that each probably only had a few thousand men. All this meant nothing. The very same day Hitler was boasting to Guderian, he got some news to the contrary. Quote, Over the last few days, there has been continued heavy movements in the Baranov bridgehead. The impression there is that they are going to start soon after all, end quote. Over the next few days, the signs multiplied, and enemy prisoners confirmed as much. The Soviets were going to attack between the 11th and the 16th, they said. They were telling the truth. On schedule, Stalin launched the Vistula Oder Offensive. At the war conference on the 12th, Hitler received the bitter news that Marshal Konev's forces had obliterated the three German divisions containing the Baranov bridgehead. By the 13th, they had advanced 20 miles. On the 14th, the two other Vistula bridgeheads had been broken out of to the south of Warsaw. The Soviets took bitter losses as they always did, especially with the Panzerfaust being such a readily available weapon now. But regardless, the superiority was simply too much. The sheer odds in terms of manpower the Germans had to face was beyond description. The collapse was total. On the 15th, Guderian was calling up begging for, quote, everything to be thrown into the Eastern Front, end quote. Meanwhile, as Hitler headed east on his train, Otto Gunscher, the SS colonel on his personal staff, joked, quote, Berlin will be the most practical of all our headquarters. We'll soon be able to take the streetcar from the Eastern Front to the Western Front, end quote. Hitler dryly laughed at the joke without enthusiasm, and the rest of his staff duly joined in. Around the same time, Hitler said to one of his secretaries who had just come from Munich, which had just received a 2,000 ton bomber attack, quote, In a very few weeks, this nightmare will suddenly stop. Our new jet aircraft are now in mass production. Soon the Allies will think twice about flying over Reich territory, end quote. On the 16th, the Fuhrer arrived in Berlin. No records survive of the conferences that day, but they were certainly stormy. General Schirner was called to command Army Group A, which had essentially collapsed, and four divisions were ordered to embark at Leopaya in the Curlin pocket, and come and reinforce the main eastern front. Soon enough, Hitler got news that Warsaw had fallen. Almost immediately afterwards, he got a radio message from the German battle commandant of Warsaw himself. He was surrounded and holding on for dear life. Unlike Budapest though, this situation was completely hopeless, and it was too late. Elsewhere in Poland, there was chaos. No one seemed to know what was going on. Conflicting reports kept reaching Hitler, including ones which completely contradicted each other. Some were even signed personally by Hitler, yet he had never seen them before. Hitler blamed Guderian's staff and imagined another conspiracy. Quote, this general staff clique has got to be stamped out, end quote. With the absolutely gigantic Soviet army getting ever closer, Hitler finally relented to Ribbentrop and let him fire off peace feelers to the Western powers. Hitler stated his logic to those around him, quote, there must be people in Britain who can see what it is they are demolishing, end quote. Earlier that month, Ribbentrop had drawn up a serious offer to the Allies. It stated, quote, that Germany retain her national frontiers and renounce both her economic autarky and her ambitions to a hegemony over Europe, that freedom of religion would be restored and the Jews resettled somewhere in an international community, end quote. Hitler personally approved this exact message, and Ribbentrop had it signed and sent to a Dr. Werner von Schmieden in Switzerland, who had great contacts with the Allies. Now, all they could do was wait. In reality though, Hitler must have known that the odds of the Allies negotiating now were slim to none. His planning for the war itself continued. There were daily conferences held in Berlin. Bormann, Goebbels, Ley, and Dönitz were ever present. Dönitz especially was working wonders at the moment. His ships had rescued, and were still rescuing, hundreds of thousands of Germans and other refugees, especially Latvians, from the eastern coastal provinces which were holding out as fortresses. On the 20th, Dönitz offered 20,000 of his naval troops to Hitler for land battles. His U-boats, too, were almost ready to wreak havoc. 107 of the new Mark 21s were being fitted out, ready to harass the long and vulnerable Allied supply lines. It must be remembered that the Allies didn't have magical production facilities in France, a nation in ruins. Their supplies had to come from far away, and thus there was the potential for this to become a great weakness in a protracted war. All along the Atlantic coast, 
Hitler had proclaimed that harbours be defended as fortresses, and indeed, many were still holding out. These bases could be used to absolutely ravage Allied supply, if they had the hypermodern submarines to do so. The Germans had their own supply problems too. Stalin, with the weaker part of his army, was planning to sweep up the last fuel reserves south of Lake Balaton in Hungary. Hitler had an idea. He said to Otto Dietrich, quote, I'm going to attack the Russians where they least expect it. The 6th SS Panzer Army is off to Budapest. If we start an offensive in Hungary, the Russians will have to go too, end quote. Guderian protested that he needed the 6th Panzer Army to defend Berlin. Hitler explained the logic to him, quote, You intend operations without gasoline? Fine, how far do you think your tanks will get, end quote. Meanwhile, in Germany itself, Himmler was put in charge of the newly created army group Vistula. The Reichsführer's job was to, quote, organize the national defense on German soil behind the entire Eastern Front, end quote. On the 23rd, the Russians reached the coast at Elbing, and East Prussia was cut off. Further south, Russian tanks were cruising into the highly industrial Upper Silesia region with ease. There seemed to be no way to halt the onslaught. The pure speed of the Russian advance had horrific results for the German people. David Irving writes, quote, Millions of Germans began fleeing westward. Every road to Berlin, Dresden, and the west was choked with fleeing refugees. The navy would evacuate 450 from the port of Pillau over the next week. 900,000 more set out on foot, despite sub-zero temperatures, along the 40-mile causeway to Danzig, or across the frozen lagoon known as the Fritz's Half. Behind them, the invading Russians, incited by Stalin and by an order signed by Marshal Zhukov himself, raped, pillaged, burned, and plundered. Galen's intelligence branch confirmed refugee columns overtaken by Soviet tanks are often machine gunned and then crushed beneath them. After spending an hour with Hitler on the 28th, Goebbels thoughtfully dictated, if the Fuhrer should succeed in turning back the tide of events, and I am firmly convinced that the chance will one day come for that, then he will not be the man of the century, but the man of the millennium, end quote. For the record, Zhukov's order read, quote, death to the Germans, we'll take revenge for all those burned to death in the devil's furnaces, poisoned in the gas chambers, shot and martyred, we'll take cruel revenge for them all, woe betide the land of murderers, this time we shall destroy the German breed, once and for all, end quote. The German civilian population were facing a state-endorsed genocide on both ends, a fact that two weeks later would become very apparent to the hordes of refugees in the Saxon capital. On the 30th, the Führer addressed his people via radio, in what would turn out to be the last time. The occasion was the 12th anniversary of his chancellorship, it's worth quoting large parts of it. It began with a long summary of his reign. Quote, My fellow Germans, National Socialists, 12 years ago when the immortalised Reich President Paul von Hindenburg entrusted me with the Chancellorship, as leader of the strongest party, Germany was faced with the same situation internally as it is today externally in terms of geopolitics. The process of economic destruction and annihilation of the Democratic Republic, initiated and continued according to plan by the Treaty of Versailles, led to a phenomenon that was gradually becoming permanent of almost 7 million unemployed, 7 million part-time workers, a ruined peasantry, destroyed trade, and a corresponding breakdown of the economy. The German ports were nothing but ship graveyards. The financial situation of the Reich threatened at any moment to lead to the collapse not only of the state, but also of the provinces and municipalities. The decisive point, however, was this. Beyond the methodical economic destruction of Germany loomed the spectre of Asiatic Bolshevism, then as now, and just as it is now on a large scale, on a small scale, the bourgeois world was completely incapable of offering effective resistance to the development in the years before we seized power. Even after the collapse of 1918, it was still not recognised that an old world was passing away, and a new one was in the making, that it could not be a question of supporting and artificially preserving what had proven decayed and rotten but that I was necessary to put what was obviously healthy in its place. An outdated social order had broken down, and any attempt to maintain it could only be in vain. It was therefore no different from what is happening today on a large scale, since the bourgeois states are also doomed to destruction, and only clearly aligned, ideologically consolidated national communities will be capable of surviving the most serious crisis in Europe in many centuries. We were only given six years of peace since January the 30th, 1933, during those six years, we achieved tremendous things, and even greater things have been planned, so many and so great that they aroused the envy of our incapable democratic neighbours. The decisive thing, however, was that in those six years, with superhuman efforts, it was possible to rehabilitate the German national body in terms of defence, to equip it not primarily with material military power, but with the spiritual will to resist and to assert itself." End quote. He then later continued into a tirade against those whom he held responsible for bringing about the war. 
the Jews. Quote, it is hardly necessary to deal with those eternal airheads who hold that a defenseless Germany would certainly never have become a victim of this international Jewish conspiracy because of its impotence. This means nothing other than turning all of the laws of nature upside down. Since when does the defenseless goose not get eaten by the fox, just because the goose is not aggressive by nature? And when will the wolf finally become a pacifist, since the sheep have no armaments? The existence of such bourgeois sheep, who believe this in all seriousness, only proves how necessary it was to do away with an age whose education system could produce and sustain such types. Indeed, it even granted them political influence. Long before National Socialism came to power, the relentless struggle against the Jewish Asiatic Bolshevism was already raging. If it did not overrun Europe in 1919-20, it was only because it was still too weak and under-equipped at that time. Its attempt to eliminate Poland was not abandoned out of compassion for the Polish, but only as a result of the lost Battle of Warsaw. Its intention to annihilate Hungary was not abandoned because they fought better of it, but because the Bolshevik force could not be maintained militarily. The attempt to crush Germany was likewise abandoned, not because they no longer desired success, but because it was not possible to eliminate our people's remaining natural resistance. Immediately, however, Jewry began with the planned internal disintegration of our people, and for this purpose, it found the best allies in those obstinate bourgeoisie who did not want to recognize that the age of the bourgeois world was coming to an end, never to return, that the era of unbridled economic liberalism had outlived its usefulness and could only lead to its own collapse, and above all, that the great task of the time could only be managed by the authoritarian, united strength of the nation, based on the law of equal rights for all, and accordingly, equal duties." End quote. Hitler then spoke on the topic of resistance and the German spiritual rebirth. Quote, the Almighty created our nation. By defending its existence, we defend his work. The fact that this defence is linked with unspeakable misfortune, suffering, and pain beyond compare only makes us more attached to this nation, but it also gives us the hardness we need to fulfil our duty, even in the worst crises, that means not only the duty towards the decent eternal Germany, but also the duty towards those few dishonourable ones who try to separate themselves from their nationality. Therefore, there is only one commandment for us in this fateful struggle. Whoever fights honourably must thereby save his own life, and those of his loved ones, those spineless cowards who stab the nation in the back will die a shameful death no matter what. The fact that National Socialism was able to awaken and strengthen this spirit in our German people is its greatest deed. Once the bells of peace ring out after this tremendous world drama has subsided, we will realise that the German people owe to this spiritual rebirth no less than this very existence in the world." End quote. The Führer later had a small prophecy for the future. Quote, I repeat my prophecy. England will not only not be able to tame Bolshevism, but its own development will inevitably follow the course of this degenerative disease. The democracies will not be able to get rid of the spirits that they themselves have summoned from the steppes of Asia. All the small European nations that capitulated in reliance on allied promises are heading for total extinction. Whether this fate befalls them a little sooner or a little later is completely irrelevant. It is exclusively tactical considerations that cause the Kremlin Jews to proceed immediately with brutality in one case and a little more cautiously in another. The end will always be the same." End quote. Hitler ended his speech to the nation on an explicitly Christian sounding tone. Quote, on this day I want to leave no doubt about another matter. In spite of an entirely hostile environment, I once chose my path and walked it as an unknown, nameless man until final victory. I was often pronounced dead, and always wished dead, but finally, I was the victor. My life today, however, is determined just as exclusively by the duties incumbent upon me. Taken together, they amount to one thing only to work and to fight for my people. I can only be released from this duty by the one who called me to it. It was in the hands of Providence when the bomb that detonated one and a half metres away from me on July the 20th failed to wipe me out and thus end my life's work. I see the fact that the Almighty protected me on that day as a confirmation of the mission given to me. In the years to come, I will therefore continue to walk this path of uncompromising representation of the interests of my people unperturbed by every crisis and every danger, and imbued with the holy conviction that in the end, the Almighty will not abandon a man who in his entire life wanted nothing more than to save his own people from a fate that they never deserved. In this hour, therefore, I appeal to the whole German people, but above all, to my old comrades in arms, and to all soldiers, to arm themselves with an even greater, hardened spirit of resistance. Until we may, as we did once before, lay a wreath on the grave of the dead of this mighty struggle with a ribbon inscribed, and yet you triumphed, nevertheless. I expect every German to fulfil his duty to the utmost, to make every sacrifice that is and must be demanded of him. I expect every healthy person to risk his life and limb in the struggle. I expect every sick and infirm or otherwise indisposed person to work to the utmost of his strength. 
I expect the inhabitants of the cities to forge the weapons for this struggle, and I expect the peasant to give bread for the soldiers and workers of this struggle with the greatest possible sacrifice. I expect all women and girls to support this struggle, as they have done up to now with the utmost fanaticism. I turn with special confidence to the German youth. By forming a sworn community, we can rightly go before the Almighty and ask for his mercy and blessing, for a people cannot do more than ensure that everyone who can fight, fights, and everyone who can work, works, and all sacrifice together, filled only with the one thought of securing freedom, national honour, and a future for life. No matter how difficult the crisis may be at the moment, it will be overcome in the end through our unshakable will, through our willingness to make sacrifices, and through our capabilities. We will survive this hardship. In this struggle, too, it will not be Central Asia that wins, but Europe, and at its head, that nation which for one and a half thousand years has represented Europe as the supreme power against the East, and will continue to do so in the future, our great German Reich, the German nation." End quote. The speech was well received by the people despite it only being just over 16 minutes in total. One of Hitler's adjutants, Alvin Broder Albrecht, wrote in his diary, quote, From all sides, the response to the Führer's speech has been indescribably positive, however gloomy the omens may be. What moved me most deeply was one telegram that arrived from a refugee column trekking from the east. It just read, Führer, we trust in you. Signed, a column passing through so-and-so, end quote. Hitler ordered Berlin's buses to rush loaves of bread to the refugee columns headed for the capital. As for the combat situation at large, January ended with Hitler receiving some extremely distressing news. At 5.30am on the 31st, he was informed that Russian tanks had just crossed the frozen Oder River. The only defenders of the western bank of the river were the elderly Volkssturm battalions. They were able to slow the Russians down, whilst Hitler ordered over 300 anti-aircraft batteries to be transferred to the Oder Line's anti-tank defence. Most notably, this included every single anti-aircraft artillery piece in Dresden. Hitler, rather ridiculously, felt that by weakening the air defences in Germany, then the Allies might somehow cool down. In the Aegean, there were German-held islands, which were not only not being bombed, but were being offered supplies secretly by the British themselves. The naval staff stated this was, quote, so that the British do not need to defend them against the Russians or any other usurpers." End quote. In this same vein, the Eastern Front took priority everywhere. Oil, and even ammunition, was now in short supply. The West was to make constant cutbacks to hold the East. The Allied gamble had failed anyway, and from now on, it was but a sideshow. Sure, in the West, the Allies were hardly behaving well. In occupied areas with Germans in them, rape was rather frequent, often in a coerced manner to prevent starvation, but also often outright forced. In the East, however, it was a completely different ball game. It was a genocide and perhaps the greatest mass rape in human history. Even historians as thoroughly biased as Anthony Beaver lay the facts out plainly for all to see. Women were simply taken in front of their families and used as sex slaves. When the Soviets were done with them, they'd often simply kill them in the most brutal fashion imaginable. All across the countryside, there was women, their minds broken from having been molested so many times, just idly wandering hopelessly in an insane state until the next Soviet division would come along, and so the cycle continued. Age was but a number. Tiny children and old grandmas alike got the same treatment. Suicide was endemic. This was but one aspect. One of the most horrifying was how many children were killed, and in such a brutal fashion. One of the Soviets' favourite methods was to smash babies' heads off of walls in front of their horrified parents. Thousands upon thousands of defenceless babies met their deaths this way, their fathers off fighting for the fatherland or long since dead, their mothers unable to defend them. Many mothers, quite understandably, killed themselves afterwards. It's no wonder the priority now became all about the East, and there's a reason the great allied narrative tends to die off as they march into Germany itself. The reality is, they had very little opposition. Everything of importance was in the East, where the Germans were fighting tooth and nail for every civilian life that could be spared the fate of the Soviet occupation. In the German national consciousness, the Allies, despite what the RAF had been getting up to for years now, were more humane. They were happy to essentially let the Allies go at it by land and air. It was all small fry compared to the East. Any hate for the Allies was essentially consumed by the fear of the Soviets. Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt had other ideas. The refugee chaos was to be exploited to the utmost. On the 3rd of February, 1,000 heavy bombers were sent to greet the overpacked capital. The very heart of Berlin was simply torn out. It was a massacre. Not of troops, but of women and children. Hitler himself took the ground after this. The government quarter was now a shambles. Bormann recorded, quote, The Reich Chancellery Garden is an amazing sight. Deep craters and fallen trees, and the paths obliterated by rubble and debris. 
The Führer's residence was hit several times, and only fragments remain of the walls of the Winter Garden and Banqueting Hall." End quote. Rudolf Ribbentrop, the son of the foreign minister, saw Hitler for the first time since 1940, as his father was taken down into the Führer bunker. He was shaken by the now elderly looking Hitler's appearance. It was a different man. Thankfully for the city at large, they were now to be spared the worst of what those in the east were now experiencing in full force. The ice on the Oder was beginning to thaw, and the Führer ordered icebreakers and explosives to speed up the process. Nature was to halt the Soviet advance, offering a brief respite. By February the 8th, the capital was considered safe, for now. The chaos ensued elsewhere, however. Goering, as usual, got the blame. The Luftwaffe was absolutely impotent, as it had been for years now. The former cruise liner, the Wilhelm Gustloff, a refugee ship, was sunk by the Soviets. Over 9,000 innocent civilians drowned in the icy Baltic Sea as a result. The hospital ship, Steuben, met the same fate. 2,500 casualties and 1,000 refugees drowned. Dönitz laid the blame squarely at the feet of Göring. Where on earth were his anti-submarine patrols? The Reichsmarschall began to sign off belated death sentences to Luftwaffe officers for desertion, espionage, corruption and loose living amongst other things, but this was all immaterial. The Luftwaffe wasn't doing its job and no amount of death sentences would change that. No word had come from the Allies yet in regard to the German peace proposals. The Germans began to wonder why, as the Soviets were making their next moves rather plain. Surely the Allies couldn't be so naive as to allow the Soviets free reign in Eastern Europe, they thought. In Bulgaria, King Boris's successors had simply been shot. In Poland, the puppet regime had announced the incorporation of East Prussia and Silesia. Hitler took to escapism to deal with the endless stream of bad news. Irving writes, quote, Late on February the 9th, Professor Giesler unveiled to him his model for the reconstruction of the city of Linz. Hitler had decreed that Linz must replace Budapest as the Danube's fairest city. It was to have a concert hall seating 35,000 and a bell tower 500 feet high, with Hitler's parents entombed in a crypt at its base. On the north bank and a major replanning of the old city on the south, a wide ceremonial mall was to extend from the railroad station to the city centre, flanked by opera houses, theatres, a museum, library and immense art gallery. Now in Giesler's model, it all took shape before Hitler's eyes. At 4am that morning, February the 10th, he again stole into the shelter where the model was laid out, and he returned at 3am the morning after. When Kaltenbrunner came with reports of declining public morale, Hitler took the SS general, himself a native of Linz, into the model room. For many minutes, Hitler described how Linz would arise anew when victory was theirs. As the ponderous, scar-faced general slowly warmed to the theme, Hitler challenged him. My dear Kaltenbrunner, do you imagine I could talk like this about my plans for the future if I did not believe deep down that we really are going to win this war in the end? end quote. Hitler's rants became more and more pronounced as the end approached too. Guderian was to catch one of these when he was caught making a remark that the war was lost to Ribbentrop. Hitler raged, quote, In a situation like this, any sign of defeatism is open treachery. That is just what General Guderian's recent discussion with Ribbentrop amounts to. It must be clear to everybody that if I throw an ordinary workman who mutters defeatist remarks in an air raid shelter into a concentration camp or hang him, I must expect at least as much from you. This kind of sedition has got to stop, end quote. On the 13th, the announcement came through from the Yalta Conference. Germany was to be carved up into occupation zones. Hitler was delighted. He had been proved right once again. The Allies were going to occupy Germany and then never leave again. Quote, so much for the drivel talked about by our coffeehouse diplomats and foreign ministry politicos. Here, they have it in black and white. If we lose the war, Germany will cease to exist. What matters now is to keep our nerve and not give in, end quote. That same evening, Hitler retreated downstairs to see his model of Linz again. At 8pm, he dined with two secretaries, and then slept until it was time for the midnight conference. It was at this conference that Hitler got the horrifying news. Dresden, the Saxon capital, filled to the brim with one million refugees, was being firebombed to smithereens. Before the conference was over, more news came. Dresden was being bombed again. This raid was twice as heavy as the first. In the city, there were no flat guns, no shelters, and no fighters were operating. The city had been an open refugee centre. It was in no way, shape, or form a military target. No one expected it to be bombed. It was genocide on a horrifying scale. The events defied description. At 1pm the next day, when Hitler was awoken again, he was informed that American bombers were continuing the attack. The city of Dresden, the Florence of the Elbe, had essentially ceased to exist. That same day, Hitler bumped into Dr. Giesing, the doctor who had treated his ear problems after the July the 20th attack the year previous. After intensely asking over and over again how his family was and where he now worked, 
Hitler stated, quote, In no time at all, I'm going to start using my victory weapon, and then the war will come to a glorious end. Some time ago, we solved the problem of nuclear fission, and we have developed it so far that we can exploit the energy for armaments purposes. They won't know what hit them. It's the weapon of the future. With it, Germany's future is assured. It was providence that allowed me to perceive this final path to victory." End quote. Hitler then asked for a third time where his family was. It was as if he had some kind of dementia. Giesing left the encounter utterly bewildered. Later that evening, Hitler was given the Dresden figures. 250,000 was the latest figure, and the large number of the bodies were simply unrecoverable. All that was left was piles of goo on the floor or a few ashes. Hitler lamented, quote, They flatten the Dresden Opera House and wipe out refugees, but Stettin Harbour, jam-packed with troop transports, they leave alone, end quote. At 7.15pm, Hitler and Goebbels discussed Dresden for 45 minutes. Dr. Goebbels stated that Goering should be hauled before the People's Court for his failure to defend the civilian population. Hitler, however, would hear nothing of the sort. On the 15th, Dr. Morrell wrote about Hitler in his diary, quote, Morrell, poor, seems mistrustful, thanks to the situation on the Eastern Front and the air raids on Dresden, end quote. Two days later, he added, quote, says he has no complaints at all apart from the tremor which, as I observed last night at tea, is now badly affecting his left hand too. During our conversation, he voiced a wish that I might sometime try a few shots of strophotin, as these once worked for an entire year. These last four or five days has seemed extremely subdued. He looks tired and sleepless. The Fuhrer will try to get by without sedatives, end quote. In this depressing time of aerial genocide, Dr. Goebbels had an idea. He proposed that for every German civilian killed in an air raid, an Allied prisoner should be executed. Hitler seemed to agree with the idea. Quote, this constant snivelling about humanity will cost us the war. Neither the Russians in the East, nor these hypocrites in the West, stick to the Geneva Convention. Just look at this attack on the civilian population. End quote. Hitler pushed this point home and spoke about how German airmen fared in Russia. Quote, our airmen couldn't be persuaded to fly over Moscow or Leningrad for their lives after the Russians began executing Luftwaffe airmen. They just published that enemy parachutists had been found and exterminated, end quote. Ultimately, though, the idea of repudiating the Geneva Convention never took place. Keitel, Yodel, and Dernitz all opposed it. Wolfe Huell was absolutely horrified and summoned Ribbentrop, who ultimately talked Hitler out of it during a 40-minute walk in the Chancellery Gardens. Hitler, however, was a changed man after Dresden, Irving explains his new mood, quote, In stacks of 500 at a time, Dresden's air raid victims were publicly cremated on makeshift grids of steel girders. Hitler saw the pictures, the thousands of men and women and children, still in their Mardi Gras fancy dress costumes, being stacked like rotting cabbages under the bonfires. Where was the justice in history if an enemy could vanquish Germany by means such as these? This was the mood that impelled him now, end quote. On the 24th of February, Hitler gave a talk to 60 or 70 Gauleiters in an undamaged part of the Chancellery. He spoke of an upcoming counterattack in the East, and how he wished he had more generals like the late General Hube, who could carry out his wishes. He went on to ask for one final superhuman effort from the party, so that the war could be won. Then he ominously said that if the German people gave up now, they would deserve their annihilation. At one stage during the conference, Hitler attempted to drink a glass of water. The process of simply getting it to his lips was too much for him with his tremor now. He stated, quote, I used to have this tremor in my leg. Now it's in my arm. I can only hope it won't proceed to my head. But even if it does, I can only say this. My heart will never quaver, end quote. Luckily for the Soviets, though, the war wasn't run via Hitler's heart, but by the ability of the German armed forces to defend themselves. On the 27th, Zhukov's men smashed through Pomerania in the north. Two entire tank armies began to race for the north coast near Kuslin. On that same day, Goebbels was saying to Hitler that their only realistic aim now should be to set an example for their grandchildren in case a similar misfortune was ever to befall them, too. Hitler agreed with this wildly uninspiring argument. On the 3rd of March, Hitler visited the front line for the very last time at the bridgehead at Frankfurt on Oder. Goebbels said, quote, The effect on officers and other ranks was enormous. End quote. On his journey, Hitler saw the endless horde of refugees. Ten million were now fleeing westwards to escape the Soviet onslaught of rape, murder, and pillage. Hitler couldn't be everywhere at once, however, and the troops elsewhere were beginning to feel the pressure. Desertion was commonplace. Many men quite simply couldn't take the heat anymore. Bormann's staff proposed the hanging of cowards and deserters, like Karl Hanke had been doing in his incredible defence of Breslau, under the slogan, quote, 
death and dishonour to those who fear an honourable death, end quote. Hitler, meanwhile, proposed two odd solutions to Himmler. He said that Gertrude Schlussklink, leader of the National Socialist Women's League, should be consulted on the idea of creating a women's battalion. Also, 6,000 youths of 15 should be recruited to reinforce Himmler's rear lines of defence. Effectively, Hitler was proposing getting women and children to strengthen the front in order to shame the men not to desert. In the West, desertion was even worse. Irving writes, quote, In the West, on February the 28th, the Americans began advancing on the Rhine between Dusseldorf and Venlo. American tanks flying German colours tried to rush the Rhine bridges at Dusseldorf and Erdingen, but these, and every other bridge from Duisburg down to Koblenz, were destroyed in the nick of time. The apathy of the people west of the Rhine shocked Hitler. White flags fluttered everywhere. Local farmers attacked German troops. At Trier, the Volkssturm melted away. Other Volkssturm units were reported throwing bazookas, machine guns, and ammunition into lakes and rivers. At Remagen, American troops entering the town were astonished to find the railway bridge across the Rhine still intact, and flung an immediate armoured bridgehead onto the eastern shore. Most of Cologne was overrun." End quote. These were the same people who had been getting especially pummeled by Allied air raids for the past five years, yet they simply couldn't take it any longer. As noted, any resistance in the West post Ardennes offensive is barely worthy of a footnote. If anything, the Soviets were making their lives a lot more difficult with their otherworldly brutality. Otherwise, most German civilians, and indeed, many German troops, would have given up without much ado. Even Himmler had given up. On the 8th of March, he abandoned his command staff in Pomerania for a health clinic at Hohenlinden. He pleaded to Hitler, saying he was sick with angina. Hitler, however, was beginning to lose faith with Himmler, one of the very few who had retained his faith the entire war. Goering, too, embarrassed himself. He came to Hitler and said that now was maybe the time to clear the air politically. Hitler replied sarcastically that it was time Goering cleared the air literally. On the 15th, Hitler was telling Kesselring about a coming great defensive victory in the East. After this, he said, Germany would revert their tank output back west. The plan was to thrust north from the bridgehead at Frankfurt on Oder to disrupt Zhukov's forces massing at Kostrin. The Soviets were to be deceived into believing the thrust would be south. That was it. That was the whole plan, and it was all Hitler had left. His men, meanwhile, chose to trust him. As Dönitz had said earlier that month to his commanders, quote, Let us place our trust unconditionally in Adolf Hitler's leadership. Believe me, in my two years as naval commander-in-chief, I have found that his strategic views always turned out right, end quote. Hitler's real master strategy, though, as always, was to play for time. Even at this late hour, Hitler believed a split between the Allies and the Soviets was imminent. Stalin, too, had similar worries. In April, there was a Soviet raid at Templin. Under interrogation, all of the captured Russians opened up about their mission. It was to find out what plans the Allies had made for attacking the Soviets. Hitler always drew the comparison with the Seven Years' War, and indeed, if this war had dragged into its seventh year, he might have been able to reap the rewards of an Allied Soviet split. Whilst Hitler worried about prolonging the war, his people were suffering from its length. Over one million people had now died from Allied bombing raids, and the numbers were only increasing. Ever since Dresden, Chemnitz, Duisburg, Worms, Kassel, and the ancient city of Würzburg had all been gutted by flames and explosives. There was no question of going easy on the Germans, despite the die so obviously being already cast by now. Hitler was at a loss of what to do. He lamented to General Koller, quote, You must help me. We can't go on like this. What am I to do against this nightmare terror bombing and the murder of our women and children? End quote. Earlier that day, he had got reports of German troops saving an American bomber crew who were about to be lynched by furious German civilians. Hitler was absolutely seething with rage, almost like never before. He screamed, quote, these are the men who are murdering German women and children. It's incredible, end quote. He then said to Colton Brunner, quote, I order that all bomber crews shot down these last few months or in the future are to be turned over to the SD at once and liquidated, end quote. Collar suggested patience, quote, When our jet squadrons get stronger, the war in the air of Germany will turn in our favour again, end quote. Hitler disagreed, quote, I cannot wait until then. If these airmen realise that in the future they will be liquidated as terrorists, they'll think twice about whether to fly over, end quote. Koller replied that neither the SD nor the Luftwaffe would agree to follow through with such an order. So much for Hitler's dictatorship, his authority was crumbling. Whilst Hitler worried about winning the war, Ribbentrop and Himmler worried about ending it. Peace feelers were relentlessly fired off in neutral Switzerland and Sweden, this time without Hitler's consent. The Soviets and the Americans reacted very positively, whereas the British, as always, dismissed them out of hand as Churchill had commanded. In the West, everything finally collapsed in late March. The Rhine was crossed. Entire companies of German troops began to throw down their weapons and desert. The Germans physically couldn't destroy all the bridges. 
The Americans just kept repairing the others in the meanwhile. In the east, Kohlberg fell after a heroic siege in which 60,000 civilians managed to escape by sea from the oncoming Poles and Russians, thirsting for revenge. In Hungary, the German counterattack failed completely. On the 25th, Hitler admitted to Gauleiter Fritz Saukel that he feared the war was lost. The Führer was by now fully aware what defeat meant. American indoctrination manuals had been captured, which laid bare the seething hatred that was being instilled against the average German. One of the Führer's adjutants said it reminded him of some of the more genocidal passages of the Old Testament. British plans for post-war Germany were also captured. The manual was for an operation named Eclipse. It laid bare the dissection of Germany and Berlin into the infamous occupation zones. There was a few minor successes amidst all this failure, yet all these brought was depression. Any ground recaptured in East Prussia simply laid bare the fate of those Germans who had been unable to escape. Hitler raged, quote, It shall not be. These illiterate brutes shall not inundate all Europe. I am the last bulwark against this peril. If there is any justice, then we shall emerge victorious. One day the world will see the moral of this struggle, end quote. Quite understandably with all this pressure, most of the Reich leadership began to fold. Hitler, however, rarely wavered. He now chose to spend more time with those who fought in the same vein as him. One of these was Dr. Robert Ley, leader of the German Labour Front. Together, they spent many hours in private conversation in Berlin. Ley was a very emotional character, yet when he left Berlin, he was instilled with a fresh iron determination by the Führer. He said after the war, quote, The Führer was head and shoulders above us all, and we were too puny for this titan, end quote. Ley had a new conviction that he would form an Adolf Hitler Free Corps in Austria, tank destroyer teams armed with Panzerfausts who would operate behind enemy lines and cause chaos. Another topic the two spoke about was Himmler. Ley recalled, quote, The Führer saw through Himmler. I had a long talk with the Führer at the time, in which he bitterly complained of Himmler's disobedience, dishonesty, and incompetence, end quote. On the 20th of March, Hitler dismissed Himmler from his command of Army Group Vistula. Disloyalty was everywhere. Few remained loyal to Hitler in the war effort until the very end. Hitler severely lacked men like Field Marshal Model, whom held out in the rear pocket until the last round of ammunition had been spent. Model then said to his staff before dissolving his command, quote, Has everything been done to justify our actions in the light of history? What can there be left for a commander in defeat? In antiquity, they took poison, end quote. He then killed himself. Gauleiter Karl Hanker in encircled Breslau held on to the bitter end. On the Czech frontier, General Scherner fought a 20-day defensive battle for the industrial city of Ostrava and took home a convincing victory, for which he was appointed field marshal. Hitler said of Scherner, quote, One hell of a fellow, the kind you can blindly rely on, end quote. This was the exact kind of fanaticism that had saved Russia in 1941 and 42, and exactly what Hitler demanded of his generals as well. Most, however, were busy preparing excuses for the inevitable war crimes trials after the war. Speer was the most egregious example. In January, the tricky armaments minister had no qualms about rushing to destroy the Hungarian oil refineries prematurely, which the army was only just able to stop in time. By March, though, he was entirely focused on saving his own skin, not Germany's. Speer himself would later say during his act at the Nuremberg trials that he had, quote, counted up all of the acts of high treason which he had committed from the end of January onward and had arrived at a total of over 60, end quote. All over Germany, Speer had been driving around, urging anyone who would listen to disregard Hitler's scorched earth policy. As a result, a plethora of vital intact factories fell into Soviet and Allied hands. Hitler had specifically ordered that all military, transportation, communication, and public utility installations should be destroyed, quote, insofar as they may be of use to the enemy in the furtherance of his fight, end quote. Yet Speer, desperate to save his own life after the war, twisted this as a policy of total destruction in which Hitler wanted to raise Germany to the ground. The truth was murky and somewhere in the middle. Hitler had indeed grown cold, and his consideration of civilian life had reduced dramatically. At Nuremberg, Speer's theatrics on this point would indeed spare him. In March 1945, though, he was spreading dissent wherever he went. Speer, being as influential as he was, caused an absolute epidemic of treachery. On the 28th of March in Berlin, Hitler straight up asked him, quote, Do you still hope for a successful continuation of the war, or is your faith shattered? End quote. He was then given 24 hours to respond. Hitler genuinely loved Speer, and once more he suffered from one of his biggest weaknesses. Hitler was far too loyal to the wrong people. Goering had been the glaring example so far. Now he was effectively letting Speer off with high treason, despite everyone knowing the truth. A day later, Speer couldn't give Hitler a straight answer, and he was effectively fired from his post. He was, however, kept around the Chancellery as a friend. In order to make sure Hitler's actual orders were put into place, Jodl and Bormann set about shoring up the Western Front with the same fanaticism that was being shown in the East. 
The OKB order ended, quote, This is not the time or place for considering the civilian population, end quote. Meanwhile, Borman warned the Gauleiters, quote, Devil take the one who deserts his Gao under enemy attack, except with express orders from the Fuhrer, or who does not fight to the last breath in his body. He will be cast out as a deserter, and dealt with accordingly, end quote. Himmler's fall from grace continued too. His SS 6th Panzer Army had failed to save Hungary, and now the door was open to Vienna. Hitler raged, quote, If we lose the war, it will be his fault, end quote. Himmler was then booted out of Berlin and sent to Vienna to personally reprimand his SS generals. General Guderian, too, was dismissed as chief of staff after a defeat east of Berlin. Goebbels, whose star had risen and fallen many times over the years, became the shining light in Berlin who kept Hitler going. He'd recently obtained a copy of Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle's work on Frederick the Great, and in the bunker on the 30th of March, he read Hitler a relevant passage from it. Frederick was in the darkest moment of the Seven Years' War, and he saw no way out. All his generals had given up hope, and the enemies of Prussia had already begun to gloat. Frederick gloomily proclaimed in a letter to the Count de Argenson that if the tide didn't turn before a certain date, then he would accept defeat and swallow poison. Goebbels read out from Carlyle's work, quote, Brave king, tarry a while, because your days of travail will soon pass. Already the sun has risen behind the clouds of your misfortune, and soon it will shine forth, end quote. As Hitler knew, three days before the king's deadline, the Russian Tsarina died, and Peter III took Russia out of the war. Prussia was saved. As Goebbels put the book down, he could clearly see Hitler's eyes welling up with tears. At the April the 1st conference, Hitler shouted out, quote, Anybody retreating in Austria is to be shot, end quote. On the 5th, General Wehrler's army group south retreated 50 miles. Bormann wrote down in his diary, quote, The Bolsheviks are outside Vienna, end quote. Vola, meanwhile, would live until 1987. Hitler only fired and replaced him. One of Bormann's party officials called in, quote, None of the army group gentlemen has the slightest faith in their ability to hold back the enemy from penetrating the petroleum fields, nor in fact, and this I must state plainly, do they believe that we can still win. The Luftwaffe blew up all of Vienna's searchlight sites on the night of April 3rd without a word to the army group, end quote. In Vienna itself, it was Paris all over again, Scorzani reported that whilst tank brigades were running out of petrol, retreating Luftwaffe units were passing the opposite direction with truckloads of girls and furniture. Meanwhile, back in Berlin, Hitler barely went outside except for his daily visit to an upper floor of the Reich Chancellery for a meal. Morel noted, quote, Even the main daily war conference has been held for some time now down in the bunker, for security reasons, as the Führer told me, end quote. As for his health, the Führer's tremor was more pronounced than ever. Morel diagnosed Parkinson's disease. His eyesight, too, was in terminal decline. He couldn't even read the huge font typewriters anymore without glasses. His hair was turning grey, and his breath began to stink, according to Dr. Morell. On the 7th, Hitler had a visit from a famous eye doctor, Professor Lowline, who noted, quote, There is a secretion from both eyes of late, which is understandable in view of the dusty atmosphere in the centre of Berlin. The Führer generally leaves the well-ventilated and illuminated bunker only for short periods, for half an hour to two hours daily, and then goes into the Reich's Chancellery's garden, which is now badly damaged, but is, of course, quite dusty, particularly when windy. He finds himself then very sensitive both to light and the dust-laden wind. It is difficult to arrange a set treatment in view of the irregularity of his existence and the need for him to be completely available for reports, etc." End quote. The Soviets, meanwhile, were preparing for their grand offensive into Berlin. Hitler refused to believe it, and suggested that the real attack would be towards Prague, so the industrial regions could be secured before the Americans got there. Hitler had earlier poked fun at Guderian over this point, quote, The Russians won't be as stupid as us. We were dazzled by our nearness to Moscow, and just had to capture the capital. Remember, Guderian, you were the one who wanted to be first into Moscow at the head of your army, and just look at the consequences, end quote. Hitler impulsively ordered four entire SS panzer divisions to leave General Buss's defence at east of Berlin, and head south to help General Schoerner in Czechia. By the 11th of April, the situation was critical in the west too. The Americans were now 60 miles west of Berlin at Magdeburg. This fact barely got a mention, however. Barely anyone cared about the Western Front. It was basically wide open. In the east, Hitler lived in delusion. He confidently boasted about the upcoming Oder offensive. Quote, the Russians are going to suffer their bloodiest defeat ever, end quote. Yet on the 15th, the quartermaster general openly warned that all munition supplies would soon come to an end, obviously, because the factories were in enemy hands. With the Americans advancing rapidly, 
Hitler had his bargaining chips moved south from the western camps. These included men like Kurt Schusnig and his family, Hjalmar Schacht, General Holder, Molotov's nephew, and the British intelligence officer kidnapped in Venlo in 1939. Others were less fortunate. Admiral Canaris and General Oster, amongst others, were executed for treason. No one could countenance them getting out alive if Germany lost the war. Talking of going south, there was also a vague idea of setting up a defence in the easily defensible mountains of Bohemia, Bavaria, and northern Italy. When the Reich was inevitably split in two, then Admiral Dönitz would rule the north, whilst Kesselring would rule the south. Kesselring met the Führer on the 12th. Here he was subjected to the usual charade about superweapons, the coming great victory on the Oder and the Elbe, and the imminent rupture between Stalin and the Allies. General Busse shared Hitler's confidence. He said to Goebbels, quote, if need be, we'll stand fast here until the Americans are kicking us in the arse, end quote. Goebbels then spoke of an imminent miracle, just like in 1762 with Frederick. One cheeky officer said ironically, quote, which Tsarina is going to die then, end quote. Goebbels quickly found his answer. That evening on the 12th, the news reached Hitler that President Roosevelt had died. Goebbels phoned up, his voice shrill with excitement. This was the moment they had been waiting for. Quote, this is the turning point, end quote. Irving writes, quote, All Hitler's ministers agreed that God had wrought a swift and terrible judgment on their hated enemy, end quote. The next morning, Hitler cooked up his last proclamation to his soldiers on the Eastern Front, which began, quote, For one last time, our mortal enemies, the Jewish Bolsheviks, are throwing their weight into the attack, end quote. It ended with a reference to Roosevelt, quote, At this moment, when fate has carried off the greatest war criminal of all times from the face of the earth, the war's turning point has come, end quote. That evening, however, Hitler allowed the Reich's diplomatic corps to evacuate Berlin for southern Germany. On the 14th, Russian shelling increased all over General Busse's positions. 200 Russian tanks launched attacks, too. 98 of them were left in a flaming wreck. They dared not try again the next day, the 15th, which was quiet. It was on this same day that Eva Braun unexpectedly turned up in Berlin. She'd hitched a ride all the way from Bavaria to die at Hitler's side. Many of Hitler's male staff made the same decision and found it an easy one. One of Hitler's adjutants, Alvin Broder Albrecht, wrote home to his wife, quote, It is certainly hard for us men to stand in our last battle far from our families, knowing that our wives and children will have to face the trials of life alone. But hundreds of thousands of others have found the strength, and I am trying to set an example, however humble, to all my compatriots, end quote. At midnight on the 15th, Hitler got some startling news. General Hinrichi had asked permission to transfer his army group HQ to a new site in the rear of Berlin, behind Hitler's own headquarters. This was completely in defiance of Hitler's previous orders. He decided that if the Oder front collapsed, then Berlin would be handed over without a fight. Speer later claimed responsibility for convincing him to make this decision. Hitler, obviously, declined such a request. At 5am the next morning, the 16th, a gigantic Soviet artillery barrage began all along the Oder and Nisa rivers. The near-abandoned German positions were absolutely torn to pieces by the 500,000 shells. At 6.30am, Zhukov's tanks came roaring forwards at Frankfurt on Oder. An hour later, the main assault began. The Luftwaffe, at least, the ones who didn't run off with women and loot yet, made their last roll of the dice and immediately went into action. 60 fanatical Luftwaffe pilots even launched kamikaze bombing raids into the Oder bridges, across which the enemy was flooding. By evening, a five-mile deep breach had been created near Friesen, yet back in the Chancellery, Hitler's generals were determined that they achieved a resounding victory against the enemy. Christa Schroeder, one of Hitler's secretaries, however, asked him whether they should now leave Berlin. Hitler replied, quote, No, calm down, Berlin will always be German, end quote. Christa replied that she knew her life would end soon, quote, But I can't quite see how it's all going to end with the Americans coming closer every day on one side, and the Russians on the other, end quote. Hitler replied, quote, Time, we've just got to gain time, end quote. In his mind, he had more than one reason to play for time. On the 15th, Hitler had received reports that Russian officers were worried about an American attack. It seemed as if his wildest dreams were coming true. The Russians had stopped at the correct demarcation line in Austria, yet the Americans had already encroached into Stalin's zone. One Russian officer was reported as saying, quote, We must drench the Americans, accidentally, with our artillery fire, to let them taste the lash of the Red Army, end quote. This belief was essentially the sole reason he held on to the bitter end. He foresaw the Cold War better than Churchill, Roosevelt, or Stalin ever could have. Hitler just felt he had to convince the Allies. He said of Britain and America, quote, Perhaps the others can be convinced. After all, that there is only one man capable of halting the Bolshevik Colossus, and that is me, end quote. 
The Brits, pushed ever forwards by Churchill's propaganda machine, were blinded by hatred. The Americans, however, suddenly proved much more approachable. On the 17th, Himmler's representative, Fagerlein, told Hitler that secret talks in Switzerland had resulted in draft terms for a separate German allied peace on the Italian front. This was the beginning of the split Hitler had been waiting for. At 3am, Hitler sent for SS General Karl Wolf, the German conducting the talks, and congratulated him. Quote, I am grateful that you've succeeded in opening the first doorway to the West. Of course, the terms are very bad. End quote. By 5pm on the 18th though, Hitler was already having second thoughts. Whilst on a walk with Wolf, Carlton Brunner, and Fagerlein, he said, quote, I want the front to hold for eight more weeks. I am waiting for East and West to fall out. We are going to hold the Italian fortress at all costs, and Berlin too, end quote. Like a gambler, desperate to win big rather than cut his losses, it appeared Hitler was sabotaging his own master plan for peace in the West. Hitler's escapism is pretty well displayed in his goodbye to Franz von Sonnleitner. Irving writes of this encounter, quote, Franz von Sonnleitner came to take leave of Hitler. Ribbentrop was sending himself to take care of the Italian gold. Hitler probably knew he would not see this Austrian party veteran again. For a while, standing in the Chancellery's bare first floor salon with its sagging floor, they talked about Salzburg, Sonnleitner's hometown. The latter's mention that a stick of bombs had struck down the cathedral's dome was the signal for Hitler to take refuge in architectural nostalgia. The Americans, he said, were destroying Europe's great treasures because they had none of their own. He reflected on his own misplaced chivalry in sparing Rome by declaring it an open city in June 1944. He had inflicted more disadvantage on his own troops when he spared Florence's famed Ponte Vecchio too. He had ordered the destruction of the casino at Ostend, he said, only with utter reluctance to meet the demands of the local coastal sector command. He sighed and consoled Sonnleitner. Never mind, Salzburg's cathedral will be rebuilt, and fast. Seeing the diplomat's incredulous expression, Hitler continued, just think of the colossal capacity that will become available when we go over from wartime to peacetime production. They shook hands and parted, end quote. Meanwhile, the Russians continued to approach Berlin. On the 17th, Hitler ordered the Autobahn bridges blown up, and any available aircraft available was to be sent into the fray to stop the enemy reaching Cottbus, southeast of Berlin. At the midday conference, Hitler proudly boasted, quote, the Russians are in for the bloodiest defeat imaginable before they reach Berlin, end quote. On the 18th, a furious battle was underway at Silo. By evening, it was in Zhukov's hands, and Hitler demanded to know why. As it turned out, only the Dutch SS division had been thrown in for the counterattack. Hitler went berserk and got even angrier when he learned that Goebbels had sent five Volkssturm troops to the Oder front, even though these divisions were meant to be a last resort to defend their own towns and villages. Hitler was now undergoing a dangerous new treatment for his Parkinson's. He was being injected with a steadily increasing amount of Harmin and Homburg 680, both of which were chemicals extracted from deadly nightshade. On the 18th, Dr. Morell reported in his diary, quote, Tremor in the left hand somewhat improved, but drowsy. Sleeping at night, now possible, only with temper dorms, end quote. Indeed, he was barely sleeping at all. From now until the end, sleep was the last thing on Hitler's mind. Irving describes the Fuhrer around this time, quote, The days were punctuated by an unending series of ill tidings, each one bringing the end much closer than its predecessor. Restless and pallid, Hitler rambled around the shelter, took brief strolls upstairs, then sat in the telephone exchange or machine room, or visited his dogs in their makeshift kennels behind the lavatories. He took to sitting in the passageway with one of the puppies on his lap, silently staring at the officers passing by, end quote. On the 19th, it was reported that the Russians had broken out into the open country at Munchberg, east of Berlin. This was despite the fact that in just a few hours, 60 Soviet tanks had been destroyed in Munchberg alone. Indeed, all over the Eastern Front, the Soviet tanks were taking a hammering. The new tank killer teams and their Panzerfausts worked wonders. The problem was that the Soviets seemed to have an unlimited supply of these tanks. At midnight, it was the Fuhrer's 56th birthday, and Hitler had specifically asked that there be no ceremony. When the time came though, Eva Braun made him step into the anteroom and start shaking hands with the adjutants. Sauer had a gift for him, a scale model of a 350mm mortar for Hitler's collection. After this, Hitler chatted with Goebbels and Ley about his determination to fight to the bitter end in the three mountain strongholds he still held, the Alpine Redoubt, Bohemia Moravia, and Norway. For the rest of the night, he was unable to sleep. He simply laid there, lost in his own thoughts, until someone knocked and told him it was morning. Hitler replied, quote, Lynch, I haven't even slept yet. Wake me an hour later than usual, at 2pm, end quote. When he did awake properly, Berlin was under heavy air attack. Hitler sat and played with one of the puppies for a while, before heading off to an awkward silent lunch with Eva and two of his secretaries. 
After lunch, he took them to look at his model of Linz, and he showed them his childhood home. Afterwards, he headed upstairs with Goebbels into the dusty Berlin air, where he was greeted with a line of Hitler youth boys awaiting decoration. A photographer recorded as Hitler walked along the line, and the Führer ended by promising the boys that victory would be theirs, and that one day, they could proudly tell their children that they had been there when the long war was finally won. At 4pm that afternoon, he went back downstairs. Before the main conference, Hitler allowed some of his principal ministers in one at a time to offer him birthday greetings. Keitel hinted strongly that it was time for him to leave Berlin, to which Hitler replied, quote, Keitel, I know what I want. I am going to fight in front of Berlin. Fight in Berlin, and fight behind Berlin, end quote. As the conference began, the Russian spearheads were thrusting westwards both north and south of the city. The very last main road to the south would soon be cut within hours unless Schoener could pull off his counterattack. Events suddenly sped up, and Hitler authorised a splitting of command. Dönitz and part of the OKV staff were to head to northern Germany, and a group of others were to head south at once. He left a broad hint that he would join the group in the south soon afterwards. Goering jumped in and said, quote, Mein Führer, do you have any objection to my leaving for Berchtesgaden now? End quote. Hitler agreed, but Goering's real reason was that he had truckloads of loot, ready and waiting for the signal to get to safety. At 9.30pm, a new air raid began, and so Hitler sent for his two secretaries, Joanna Wolf and Christa Schroeder. Schroeder wrote an account a few days later, quote, Pale, tired and listless, he met us in his tiny bunker study, where we had eaten our meals or our tea with him of late. He said that the situation had changed for the worse over the last four days. I find myself compelled to split up my staff, and as you are the more senior, you go first. A car is leaving for the south in one hour. You can each take two suitcases. Martin Bormann will tell you the rest. I asked to stay in Berlin so that my younger colleague could go as her mother lived in Munich. He replied, No, I'm going to start a resistance movement, and I'll need you two for that. He put out his hand to stop any further argument. He noticed how downcast we were and tried to console us. We'll see you soon. I'm coming down myself in a few days' time. In the midst of our packing, the phone rang. I answered it. It was the chief. In a toneless voice, he said, Girls, we're cut off. Your car won't get through now. You'll have to fly at dawn. But soon after, he phoned again. Girls, you'll have to hurry. The plane's leaving as soon as the all clear sounds. His voice sounded melancholy and dull, and he stopped in mid-sentence. I said something, but although he still had not hung up, he made no reply, end quote. During this time, Soviet tanks had continued to pour through the gaps in the east. Hitler made order after order for his generals to deal with them, but often he was just straight up betrayed. General Hinrichi simply felt that his army should pull back now whilst it could, so he duly did so and sealed Berlin's fate. Hitler believed at the time that his orders were being obeyed. That same night, Hitler vowed not to leave Berlin no matter what, and put the idea of heading south to bed. He said to his two remaining secretaries, quote, I must force the decision here in Berlin, or go down fighting, end quote. Bormann cabled to the Burghoff, quote, Wolf is staying here, because if anybody can master the situation here, it is only he, end quote. The war conference that evening was essentially empty. Krebs' operation officer popped in to give him the news that the breach in the 4th Panzer Army was now even larger, to which Hitler calmly blamed the army's betrayal. The officer snapped back, quote, Mein Führer, do you really believe so much has been betrayed? End quote. Hitler glanced at him and replied, quote, All our defeats in the East are solely the result of treachery. End quote. At 1am, he dismissed his stenographers so they could catch that evening's plane out of Berlin. Wolfer Huell stuck his head in the conference room and asked, quote, Mein Führer, do you have any orders for me yet? End quote. Hitler shook his head, which made Ribbentrop's representative speak up, quote, Mein Führer, the zero hour is about to strike. If you still plan to achieve anything by political means, it is high time now. End quote. Hitler calmly replied, quote, when I'm dead, you'll have more than enough politics to contend with, end quote. Later that evening, over 80 staff officers headed south by air. Sauer, Speer's de facto successor, was amongst them, with orders to organise what arms production he could in the Alps. On the morning of the 21st, Berlin was being hammered. As it turned out, the artillery battery was just eight miles away at Marzahn. The atmosphere that day at the bunker was beyond depressing. No word had yet come from General Wielding's 56th Panzer Corps east of the city. The Luftwaffe, too, claimed their jets were prevented from helping due to enemy fighter patrols. Hitler barked, quote, Then the jets are quite useless. The Luftwaffe is quite superfluous, end quote. He called Koller back later that day, quote, The entire Luftwaffe command ought to be strung up, end quote. He slammed the phone down. During the afternoon, Hitler drew up his last gamble. An ad hoc battle group under SS General Steiner was to push south during the night. If he was successful, then Zhukov's advanced forces to the north of the city would be cut off. The order issued to Steiner at 5pm included the following, quote, Any officers failing to accept this order without reservations are to be arrested and shot at once. 
you will account with your life for the execution of this order, end quote. At 9 p.m., Hitler learned that a battalion of the Hermann Goering division was still ridiculously defending Goering's abandoned forest palace at Karrenhall. Hitler ordered the men to join Steiner. At 10.30 p.m., Koller called up and asked where Steiner was, to which Hitler snapped, quote, Any commander holding men back will have breathed his last breath within five hours. You yourself will pay with your life unless every last man is thrown in. Everybody into the attack from Eberswald to the south, end quote. Steiner, as we know, did nothing. After all, he was only given what Irving calls, quote, a motley collection of demoralized, ill-armed troops, end quote. Events were too much for Hitler. On the 22nd, he suffered a nervous, suicidal breakdown. Defeat seemed imminent, and the Russians were getting deeper into the city. It appears if they might even be in the government quarter itself by midnight. The world was falling apart before Hitler's eyes. At 3pm, that day's work conference began as usual. Hitler asked about the Steiner operation, to which an SS authority assured him personally that the attack had begun. Within an hour, however, Koller was on the phone with the news that Steiner had, in fact, not begun his attack yet. Irving writes of his reaction, quote, This betrayal and deceit by the SS, of all people, shook Hitler to the core. He straightened up and purpled. He suspected a fait accompli to force him to leave Berlin. His eyes bulged. That's it, he shouted. How am I supposed to direct the war in such circumstances? The war's lost. But if you gentlemen imagine I'll leave Berlin now, then you've got another thing coming. I don't put a bullet in my brains. Hitler abruptly stalked out. Wolfer Huell telephoned Foreign Minister Ribbentrop in extreme agitation. The Führer's had a nervous breakdown. He's going to shoot himself, end quote. Hitler then called up Dr. Goebbels, quote, I have decided to stay to the end of the Battle of Berlin, end quote. He then ordered the propaganda minister to bring his family with him to the bunker. The Führer then turned to Schwab, quote, Schwab, we must destroy all the documents here at once. Get some gasoline, end quote. Later that day, everyone kept trying to make Hitler reconsider his decision to remain until the bitter end. At one stage, he was cornered by Keidel, to which Hitler barked out, quote, I know what you're going to say. It's time to take a real decision, a ganzer Entschluss. I've taken it already. I'm going to defend Berlin to the bitter end. Either I restore my command here in the capital, assuming Wenck keeps the Americans off my back and throws them back over the Elbe, or I go down here in Berlin with my troops fighting for the symbol of the Reich, end quote. Jodl approached Hitler too, and told him that if Hitler killed himself in Berlin, then the German army would be without a leader. Hitler's only response was to order Jodl, Keitel and Bormann to head south to Berchtesgaden that evening to continue the war with Goering, who would be the new Führer. All three men refused. Someone in the room objected, and said that not a single German soldier would be willing to fight for Goering, to which Hitler replied, quote, There's not much fighting left to be done, and when it comes to negotiating, the Reichsmarschal will be better at it than I am, end quote. At 5pm, the Soviets were reported to have taken the Silesia train station, and a panic fell over Hitler's staff. Many of them expected to hear gunshots from the Führer's room. Hitler, for the most part, had accepted his fate. The previous year, he had said that suicide was, quote, a release from my sorrows and sleepless nights and from this nervous suffering. It takes only a fraction of a second, then one is cast free from all that and rests in eternal peace, end quote. On another occasion, he admitted to General Schoener that his death might be better for Germany, as his existence could be an obstacle between finding common cause with the Allies. He did not want Eva Braun to join him, however, that day, he told her to pack her things and head south with his last two secretaries. Ava took both his hands and said, quote, But you know, I am going to stay here with you, end quote. Hitler's eyes lit up full of emotion, and he lightly kissed her on the lips. Meanwhile, the other two secretaries chimed in and said that they too would be remaining. I wish my generals were as brave as you, Hitler said. Meanwhile, Himmler was nowhere to be seen. His liaison officer, Fagelein, called, yet Himmler refused to make an appearance evidently scared that he would be arrested due to Steiner's failure to counterattack. Fagelein was sent to meet Himmler halfway and collect him, but now Fagelein too was nowhere to be seen. Hitler also learned that day that Himmler had kept an entire battalion of 600 SS troops for his own personal safety outside Berlin. Hitler angrily ordered that they be released to help with the defence of the Chancellery in Berlin. General Gottlob Berger, one of Himmler's top SS men, appeared shortly afterwards. Hitler ranted at him about the SS's disloyalty and then ordered himself, Berger was to take as many high-ranking British and American prisoners with him to the Alpine Redoubt as hostages. More of Hitler's staff left that evening too. Dr. Morell was one of them, and he offered the Führer one last injection before he left. This time a morphine picked me up. Hitler suspected a plot to drug him, and take him away from Berlin by force however, so he refused. Quote, you can take off that uniform and go back to your practice in Kurfürstendamm, end quote. He flew out with Hitler's last two stenographers that evening. The latter had orders to take the last shorthand records to the outside world. His press officer, Heinz Lorenz, was to record the remaining war conferences in their place. On the 23rd, Lorenz recorded Hitler as saying, quote, 
It's also abominable. When you come to think it over, what's the point of living on? End quote. North of the capital, Steiner was still not moving, and Hitler's war conferences themselves now essentially forgot all about the other fronts. They solely focused on the battle for Berlin. At noon, Goebbels broadcast the following, quote, The Führer is in Berlin. Our leadership has resolved to remain in Berlin and defend the right capital to the end, end quote. In the same vein, Lorenz wrote down Hitler saying, quote, The enemy now knows I am here. That gives us an excellent opportunity of luring them into an ambush. But this depends on all our people realising the importance of this hour and genuinely obeying the orders they get from above. They must be honest about it. This business up here was downright dishonest, end quote. Irving explains what Hitler meant by this ambush. Quote, the ambush to which Hitler referred was the plan Keitel and Yodel had proposed for Wenck's army on the Elbe and Mold France to be turned around to link up south of Berlin with Buss's Ninth Army and then strike northward towards Potsdam and Berlin, mopping up the elite Russian troops they thereby cut off. At the same time, the 41st Panzer Corps, commanded by the reliable General Rudolf Holst, an old regimental comrade of Keitel's, would be brought back across the Elbe to counterattack between Spandau and Oranienburg. Steiner was to turn over his mechanized divisions to Holst. End quote. Hitler himself was all over the place. On the same day, Ava Braun wrote both of these letters to her sister. The first read, quote, "The Führer himself has lost all hope of a happy ending." End quote. The second, later that day, quote, "At present, things are said to be looking up. General Bergdorf, who gave us only a 10% chance yesterday, has raised the odds to 50/50 today." Perhaps things may turn out well after all, end quote. Dr. Goebbels' children had meanwhile arrived, and Hitler sat with them and drank hot chocolate that day on the 23rd. The children, innocently oblivious to their own situation, brought joy to the adults around them as they played with each other. After this, Keitel came to see Hitler and inquired about the state of talks with the enemy, if they existed. Hitler insisted that he needed to win one more victory, the battle for Berlin itself. He explained a proposal from Ribbentrop, Top Czech industrialists were to be flown to France that night, where they would beg the Americans to protect Bohemia and Moravia from the Soviets. Hitler had accepted this ridiculous plan. That same day, Hitler admitted to Ribbentrop that the war was lost. He did have something else to say, however. He gave Ribbentrop four secret negotiation points to put to the British if he got the chance. If the continent survived Bolshevik domination, he said, then London and Berlin must bury the hatchet. He told Ribbentrop to write secretly to Churchill on this topic. Part of the letter is now absolutely infamous. Quote, My spirit will arise from the grave. One day, people will see that I was right. End quote. When Ribbentrop left, Speer arrived. He had just landed after a risky plane ride. Ava, who had been worried about all the reports of Speer's treachery, was over the moon to see him. Quote, I knew you'd return. You won't desert the Führer. End quote. Speer replied to her that he was leaving again that evening. Hitler asked his former armaments minister about his opinion on fighting to the bitter end in Berlin. Speer replied that it was better to die here in Berlin than at the Berghof if Hitler cared for the verdict of history. Hitler, unaware that Speer had secretly arranged for Berlin to be abandoned with General Heinrichi, agreed with his judgment. After that day's war conference, Bormann burst into the room with a stunning telegram. Goering was seemingly trying to take power. The telegram from the Reichsmarschall went as follows, quote, Mein Führer, in view of your decision to remain in the fortress of Berlin, are you agreed that I immediately assume overall leadership of the Reich as your deputy, in accordance with your decree of June the 29th, 1941, with complete freedom of action at home and abroad? Unless an answer is given by 10pm, I will assume you have been deprived of your freedom of action. I shall then regard the conditions laid down by your decree as being met, and shall act in the best interest of the people and fatherland. You know my feelings for you in these hardest hours of my life, I cannot express them adequately. May God protect you and allow you to come here soon despite everything. Your loyal Hermann Goering, end quote. Ribbentrop had also got a telegram from Goering telling him to fly down to join him immediately. Goering had got in touch with Keitel too. Hitler, gravely mistrustful of Goering for years now, let Bormann take control of the situation. A telegram was sent to Goering saying that Hitler alone would decide when the decree of June the 29th, 1941 would come into effect and he was placed under house arrest. In the telegraph, Hitler had written, quote, your actions are punishable by death, but because of your valuable services in the past, I shall refrain from instituting proceedings if you will voluntarily relinquish your offices and titles. Otherwise, steps will have to be taken, end quote. This wasn't far enough for Bormann, and he got in touch with SS Colonel Frank at the Berghof and told him, quote, surround the Goering Villa at once and arrest the former Reichsmarshal Hermann Goering immediately, smashing all resistance, end quote. Bormann sent another telegram to Frank to settle his other scores too. Even at this late hour, Bormann was determined to drag his rivals down with him. Quote, you guarantee with your neck for the execution of the Führer's order. Find out where Speer is. Take Lammers into custody. Honourable, as yet. Act circumspectly but like lightning. Bormann, end quote. 
Bormann began reaching out to Dönitz and other top dogs all over Germany, telling them of Goering's supposed betrayal and whipping up an absolute storm against him. The storm was, of course, strongest of all in the bunker itself. Everyone's frustrations with their situation were thrust upon Goering's shoulders. Speer, himself a lover of intrigue, tried to get on the action too so he could see his old rival Goering put in the ground for good. He wrote to General Garland in Bavaria, requesting him to shoot Goering out of the sky. Quote, The Fuhrer has ordered Goering's arrest. I request you and your comrades to do everything to prevent any aeroplane flight by Goering in the manner discussed. End quote. At 11.44pm, a telegram arrived and Speer's dream was crushed. Frank reported, quote, Mein Fuhrer, beg to report Hermann Goering and co arrested. No incidents so far. Details follow. End quote. On the 24th, Hitler had his instructions for his army sent out by the last remaining telephone line to the outside world. There was to be attacks towards Berlin from the northwest, the southwest, and the south, with the goal being to quote, restore a broad land contact with Berlin again, thereby bringing the Battle of Berlin to a victorious conclusion. End quote. Meanwhile, a 2,700 strong Hitler Youth Tank Killer Brigade was instructed to defend the bridges across which the Soviet armies would soon march. In the north, Admiral Dönitz promised to airlift 2,000 of his best soldiers and fortress troops into Berlin within the next 48 hours. The Admiral, unlike most at this late hour, kept his promise. Ribbentrop was another who was loyal till the end. He offered Hitler personally to take up arms to defend Berlin, and he meant it. Year after year, he had offered to sacrifice himself for Hitler, whether it be tricking Stalin into a conference room and killing him, or setting off on a daring mission to negotiate peace with him. Now he was willing to take his stand in Berlin. Hitler, however, turned him down as always. Huell telegraphed him, quote, The Fuhrer appreciates your intentions, but has turned you down. Until the ring encircling Berlin has been broken open, or until you receive further instructions, you are to stand by, outside the combat area, end quote. Ribbentrop, not put off, begged a panzer unit to let him go with them on patrol so he could contribute to the cause. He was turned down by the general. Himmler, on the other hand, continued to see his star, which had shone so bright for years, plummet back down to earth. He refused to allow all of his security battalion to go and fight for the people in Berlin. He only parted with half of them, expressly against Hitler's orders. Bormann, meanwhile, sent Himmler a rambling telegram, gloating about Goering's downfall. Inside, he wrote of how much of a vile traitor the fat Reich Marshal was for trying to arrange peace with the Allied powers. On and on it went, reveling in their mutual enemy's political demise. Himmler, however, was doing the exact same thing, and soon enough, his situation would explode, much like Goering's. Outside the capital, there was both good and bad news on the 25th. The Americans and the Russians had linked up at the Elbe, and there had been no great explosion, as Hitler had envisaged for years. On the other hand, Wenck's relief attack was nearing Potsdam, and Field Marshal Schoerner had recaptured Bautzen and Wiesenberg south of Berlin. In the process, they had inflicted brutal casualties on the Soviets and had begun to proceed north towards the capital. Hitler cabled to Dönitz, quote, The attack by Schoerner's army group proves that given the will, we are still capable of beating the enemy even today, end quote. Hitler spoke on the situation on the Elbe too. Quote, the British and Americans along the Elbe are holding back. If I can win through here and hang on to the capital, perhaps hope will spring in British and American hearts that with our Nazi Germany, they may after all have some chance against this entire danger. And the only man capable of this is me. Give me one victory here, however high the price, and then I'll regain the right to eliminate the dead weights who constantly obstruct. After that, I will work with the generals who have proved their worth. End quote. Later that day, he spoke on the same topic. Quote, First, I must set an example to everybody I blamed for retreating by not retreating myself. It is possible that I will die here, but then at least I shall have died an honourable death." End quote. Irving describes the general situation in Berlin that day. Quote, the first battalion of Dönitz naval troops had arrived. The makeshift hospital in the Voss bunker, next to Hitler's bunker, filled with casualties. The government quarter was under non-stop bombardment by artillery and bombers. Wielding reported to Hitler that it was proving difficult to demolish bridges, for example, along the Teltow Canal defence line, because Speer's staff had decamped with all the bridge plans. Speer had also fought against the dismantling of the bronze lamp posts along the east-west axis to prepare an emergency landing strip." End quote. During the 26th, spirits soared as the news began to reach of Wenck and Schoerner's successes. Hitler himself met with General Grime and told him of the Goering situation. At 10pm, the radio broadcast Grime's promotion to fill Goering's shoes. That evening, Hitler was kept awake by the shelling outside and was lost in his own thoughts. Quote, Imagine, like wildfire, the word spreads throughout Berlin. One of our armies has broken through from the west and restored contact with us. The Russians have already exhausted their strength in crossing the Oder, particularly the Northern Army Group. End quote. Meanwhile, Wenck's relief force has reached Potsdam, just outside of Berlin. They were so close, yet so far to breaking the encirclement against all odds. At 5am on the 27th, the Russians began a gigantic push along the Hohenzollern Dam Boulevard. 
Goebbels put it nervously, quote, I keep getting this nightmare picture. Venk is at Potsdam, and here the Russians are pouring into Potsdamer Platz, end quote. Hitler quickly replied, quote, and I'm here at Potsdamer Platz, not Potsdam, end quote. Meanwhile, southeast of Berlin, General Buss's 9th Army was encircled. Hitler was puzzled by its new westwards movement, completely against his orders. As it turned out, Busse had decided to drive the remnants of his army to the American lines to surrender. Hitler worried himself sick in Berlin. Quote, I just don't understand the direction of its attack. Busse is driving into a complete vacuum, end quote. Meanwhile, north of Berlin, General Heinrichi promised that he was holding a line between Angermund and Uckerheim, yet when Keitel set out to check himself, he found the troops in the middle of a well-prepared retreat. It turned out that they were herding their troops across Mecklenburg towards the Allied lines. These troops were being pursued by Russian tanks, and Yodel sent Steiner's two armoured divisions northwards, away from Berlin, to stop the pursuit. It was a mess. The atmosphere at the bunker when the news arrived was hysterical. Bormann wrote in his diary, quote, The divisions marching to relieve us have been halted by Himmler and Yodel. We shall stand by and die with our Führer, loyal unto death. If others think they must act out of superior judgment, then they are sacrificing the Führer, and their loyalty, devil take them, is no better than their sense of honour, end quote. Bormann, realising that Himmler had turned to treachery too, also wrote, quote, One might have expected that H.H. would at least once he received my letter of April the 25th, would have addressed a fiery appeal to his SS. SS men, our honour is loyalty. But H.H. kept silent. While old father Keitel drove around out there, raging and roaring to raise help for us in time, H.H. tucked himself away at Hohenlinchen, and Steiner's SS force, which was supposed to move off first, just marched on the spot from the word go. It just play-acted, and this was the force that H.H. should have appealed to first and foremost. SS men, rally to your Führer, for the battle flag, fluttering ahead on high. Let's keep the oath we all swore. Our loyalty is honour. No, H.H. just kept quiet. How are we to interpret that? And what are we to make of the question he radioed to General Bergdorf? Whether the Führer might not be judging Goering's intentions too harshly. Obviously, H.H. is wholly out of touch with the situation. If the Führer dies, how does he plan to survive? Again and again, as the hours tick past, the Führer stresses how tired he is of living now, with all the treachery he has to endure. Were one to ignore the heroism of even the women and children, one could only agree with the Führer. How many disappointments this man has had to suffer until the very end, end quote. Late that evening, Soviet tanks with swastikas flying on them had reached the Wilhelmsplatz. They were detected and destroyed, but the Soviets were moving ever closer. Everything revolved around the Führer's bunker, and the entire city, and indeed, all of Europe, seemed to have mobilised to defend the man they had swore their oaths to. Frenchmen, Latvians, Swedes, Spaniards, and even Russians had joined together with the Hitler Youth, Volkssturm, SS, Wehrmacht, and Dönitz naval troops for one final stand around the bunker. Armed with their Panzerfausts, these men were all destroying tank after tank after tank. The carnage was absolutely total. The Soviets, however, just kept coming over and over again. There were reports from some Soviet defectors that tank drivers were now so scared that they had to be forced forwards again and again at pistol point. Each trek down a new street was essentially a death sentence, as some fanatical 14-year-old could simply pop out of a basement and send this vehicle sky-high with a rocket. All the defenders knew that their fight was almost certainly futile, yet fight on, they did. Back at the bunker, Hitler handed his adjutants brass case cyanide capsules to use only if necessary. He told them that soon he would order a general breakout towards Venk's army at Potsdam. He said privately to Colonel von Bilo, quote, Only my wife and I will stay behind, end quote. He also compared Ava's fidelity with that of the disloyalty of Goering and Himmler. At the late night conference that evening, General Krebs assured Hitler that the battle lines in Berlin itself were stable. Hitler youth units were holding a bridgehead to the south to anticipate Venk's arrival. Some isolated trucks in Venk's army had, in fact, already broken through. Meanwhile, Soviet snipers had begun to roam around Potsdamer Platz. Hitler himself, of course, was stood in the bunker. He could hear the Goebbels children singing as their mother put them to bed, and that evening he unpinned his own golden party medallion and put it upon Magda Goebbels. She had written, quote, The fudding of shells is getting even on my nerves, but the little ones soothe their younger sisters, and their presence here is a boon to us because now and again they manage to prize a smile from the Führer, end quote. To Hitler personally, the children had said that they eagerly awaited the day when Uncle Hitler, as they called him, would receive his new units and drive the Russians away and save the day. Uncle Hitler hoped that he could make their wish, but he knew how unlikely that was. Quote, In this city, I have had the right to command others. Now I must heed the commands of fate. Even if I could save myself here, I will not do so. The captain too goes down with his ship. End quote. 
It was the 28th, and the Chancellery itself was under direct shellfire. Hitler was spotted restlessly pacing the bunker hallways, gripping a Berlin street map in his clammy hands. Meanwhile, General Wenck's 12th Army had linked up with Buss's 9th Army, but both were at the end of their tether. In fact, they were far beyond it. The story was different in the North. Irving writes, quote, By 4.30pm, General Krebs had learned from Yodel the full extent of Heinrichi's disobedience north of Berlin. The southern flank of Mount Eiffel's 3rd Panzer Army was retreating across the Schorf Heath. Steiner was covering this illicit retreat and doing nothing to seal off the breach at Prenzlau. Keitel was apoplectic with anger and instructed Heinrichi and Mantoffel to meet him at a lonely crossroad to account for their actions. One thing was certain, Berlin's northern defences were wide open, end quote. There was more treason in the air too. Himmler's liaison officer Fagelein had been missing for much of the past week, and on the 28th, Hitler's staff began to receive erratic calls from him. Hitler felt that Fagelein was attempting to flee, and that Himmler was condoning it. Himmler himself was hardly in Hitler's good books now either. That evening, all hell broke loose, as Bormann showed the Führer the most incredible news report. Allied Radio had openly announced that Himmler had gotten contact with the US and Britain, and personally guaranteed to them Germany's unconditional surrender. Himmler wasn't in Berlin, and so everybody's eye had turned to Fagelein, who was viewed as being in on it. Hitler ordered the liaison officer's personal belongings searched, and indeed, papers were found relating to Himmler's treason. Other items found were two money belts of gold sovereigns and other enemy currencies. This was a bitter blow for Hitler. He and his soon-to-be wife had allowed Fagelein to marry Ava's sister the year before. This was betrayal within the family. Fagelein's adjutant, meanwhile, reported that he had last seen Fagelein changing into civilian clothes at his apartment. Everyone was by now thirsting for his blood. At 10pm, General Wielding reported that General Wenck's relief army was being absolutely pummeled by the Russians. The relief effort had come so close, yet it had failed. Meanwhile, Keitel was in the north single-handedly trying to whip everyone back into shape. Heinrichi had promised him to obey orders, yet that very same evening he ordered another further retreat. Keitel dismissed him. At 11.30pm, Fagelein called Ava Braun. Quote, Ava, you must abandon the Führer if you can't persuade him to leave Berlin. Don't be stupid. It's a matter of life and death now. End quote. Within an hour, Fagelein had been tracked down and brought back to the bunker, still in his civilian clothes in which he was preparing to escape. Hitler told Bormann to hand him over to SS General Monkey to assist in the fight for central Berlin. Bormann and Otto Gunscher pointed out that he would obviously just run away again, and so the Führer ordered Fagelein court-martialed and executed. Bormann wrote in his diary that evening, quote, Our Reich Chancellor is reduced to rubble. On dagger's edge, the world now stands. Treason and treachery by Himmler. Unconditional surrender announced abroad, end quote. Hitler felt that Himmler's treachery could perhaps be even greater. He felt that Himmler might be plotting to kill or kidnap him. He also began to mistrust his cyanide capsules which had been issued by Morell's replacement, an SS surgeon. He ordered Professor Werner Haase over from the Voss bunker, operating theater, to test the capsule on the largest test animal available in the bunker, Hitler's beloved dog Blondie. The dog's jaws were forced open, and the cyanide was crushed inside its mouth with pliers. The dog agonizingly howled briefly before stiffening, dead. Hitler then handed out the cyanide to his staff, and apologized that he had nothing kinder to give them as a farewell gift. Outside, Russian tanks were massing for an assault on the Chancellery. Hitler went to visit General Grimes' bed, and said to him, quote, Our only hope is Venk. We must throw in every plane we've got to cover his breakthrough, end quote. He must have known that he was doomed now in reality. Amazingly though, a plane that just made a brilliant landing in the small territory that remained. Hitler ordered General Grime to get himself to Recklin Air Base to command a Luftwaffe attack to assist Wenck. He also had another order, arrest Himmler. Hitler went to his empty map room table and looked at his notepad. He suddenly shouted out, my political testament, and began writing without notes. Part of it read, quote, from the sacrifice of our soldiers and my own comradeship with them unto death, we have sown a seed which one day in Germany's history will blossom forth into a glorious rebirth of the National Socialist Movement, and thus bring about a truly united nation." End quote. Inside the testament, he dismissed Goering and Himmler from the party. Speer was officially sacked, and Dönitz was appointed as his official successor. Field Marshal Schoerner was meanwhile appointed commander-in-chief of the German army. The day before, Hitler had said that Schoerner was, quote, the only man to shine as a real warlord on the entire Eastern Front, end quote. Something else personally important was written in his testament. Quote, During my years of struggle, I believed I ought not to engage in marriage, but now my mortal span is at its end. I have resolved to take as my wife the woman who came to this city when it was already virtually under siege, after long years of true friendship, to link her fate with my own. 
It is her wish to go with me to her death, as my wife. This will make up for all I could not give her because of my own commitments on behalf of my people." End quote. A small wedding was held, and Goebbels had ordered the SS to find a man he knew who held the right qualifications to make it official. Wolfer Wagner, the notary, showed up still wearing his Volkssturm armband, and made Eva Braun into Eva Hitler, at least in the States, if not God's eyes. Wagner immediately went back off to join his unit in defending the Potsdamer Platz, where his friend and company commander was severely wounded. Wagner then took charge himself, and within 24 hours of overseeing the wedding, he was shot in the head and killed. Hitler discussed his new cabinet with Goebbels and Bormann. Dönitz would carry the war forward against what Hitler called, quote, the poisoner of all nations, international jury, end quote. Goebbels would be Reich Chancellor, whilst most of the rest of the cabinet were more moderate men to appeal to the Allies. Allied to Karl Hanke, currently fighting his heroic defence in Breslau, was to replace Himmler as Reichsführer SS and Chief of Police. From now on, Hitler got barely any news, and the conferences were essentially pointless. Most news came from enemy news bulletins, and these served as Hitler's best source on his own armies. Italian radio was also monitored. This was how Hitler learned of the fate of Mussolini and his mistress. For years he had said that his fate was intertwined with Mussolini's, and indeed, it was coming true after all. Hitler fired off messages via whatever unreliable channels were still available. One of them read, quote, My regards to Venk, and tell him to hurry, or it'll be too late, end quote. His testament was also distributed out. Hitler wanted a copy to reach the outside world. One was sent to Dernitz, one to Schoener, and one to the Obersalzburg. Orders were attached, quote, This testament is to be published as soon as the Führer so orders, or his death is confirmed, end quote. Back in the bunker, Hitler wrote a last letter to Keitel, in which he ordered him to support Admiral Dernitz to the end. Some of it read, quote, Many people have abused my trust in them. Disloyalty and betrayal have undermined our resistance throughout this war. This is why it was not granted to me to lead my people to victory. End quote. At 7.52, Hitler had some questions for Yodel via signal. Quote, 1. Where are Venk's spearheads? 2. When do they attack? 3. Where is the Ninth Army? 4. In which direction is Ninth Army breaking through? 5. Where are Holst's spearheads? End quote. It was as if he was searching for final confirmation that there would be no positive surprises. Ava suggested that all the women in the Chancellery shelters should meet the Führer. Amongst them were refugees, nurses, cooks and officers' wives. Hitler shook hands with all of them and spoke a few words with each in a quiet voice. One of the nurses burst into a hysterical speech about how their Führer would bring them final victory after all. Hitler, however, simply silenced her and said, quote, One must accept one's fate like a man, end quote. The next morning, the 30th, Hitler had made his final decision. The Russians were closing in. There were no rockets left for Panzerfausts. The relief army wasn't coming. It was all over. He would kill himself at 3pm. He shaved and dressed as usual, and then sent for Bormann and Gunscher. He told them he wanted Gunscher to check that he and Ava were really dead when they attempted suicide, even if it meant delivering the coup de grace. He was then to burn the bodies to ashes. Quote, I would not want my body put on display in some waxworks in the future. End quote. Magda Goebbels dropped to her knees and begged the Führer not to kill himself, but he calmly explained to her that his death would remove the last obstacle blocking Dönitz's path towards saving Germany. Hitler then assembled his female staff and they had their last lunch together. He and Eva walked through the bunker afterwards, wishing farewell to everyone. In the bunker, there was a group of officers holding two stretchers near the exit. At 3.30pm, Adolf and Eva Hitler went into the study and he closed the doors behind them. Eva sat down on the couch and kicked off her shoes, putting her feet up. Hitler sat down next to her. On his right was a photograph of his mother, and in front of him was the portrait of Frederick the Great which had followed him everywhere throughout his journey over the last six years. The couple then unscrewed their cyanide capsules. Ava put her head on his shoulder and bit down on the glass. Her knees drew up in agony. Then Hitler, controlling his trembling hand, raised his pistol to his right temple, clenched his teeth on the capsule in his mouth, and pulled the trigger. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please do leave a like if you made it this far. It means a lot. And with the end of this video, that means that my series on the life of Adolf Hitler is officially over after 11 months. I did a poll on my telegram for which leading figure you guys wanted to see next. The options were Mussolini, Churchill, and Stalin, and Mussolini came out as the clear favourite, so I'll get started on that sometime in the near future. I'm not sure if I'll do a series of this length again in this detail though, so it'll either be a very long video or a mini-series this time around. Hopefully, I'll see you there. As always though, the biggest thank you of all goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who truly do make these videos possible. Thank you to Lobster to You, Darwe Lolalol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Winstanley, Wunderwaffe, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, 
Guy's Longanese Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rucksack Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste, Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig 1919, Gloomy, Troy Harser, Jagdkampf, Rowan, Swedish Chef, Honda, Mirko, David Byers, Max Anton, Gragas, Conqueror, Espen, Can, Luca Marincic, Veritas Unleashed, The Real G, Joel, Ghost0128, Jack, Bobby Atkinson, John DeGrief, Ward, Crankless, Dramatic Equation, Russ Hale, Senator Armstrong, Lucas Drury, Mark Smith, Shameful Display, Sneed Seed and Feed, Bruno, Emma Magishmail, William S., Ozzy Mandias, Sword Dog, Ozzy Wands, Prada, Ozzy Zuma, Joe Ford, Jive Ginseng, Mr. Toad, Lay Agnew, Carolyn J., Alex D., Violently Normal, Brendan Stout, K. Reich, Unlikely Balmer, Enclave, Welcome to Kali Yuga, The Old Fault, Justin F., Lane Perkins, King Fried Chicken, Rennie Malmgren, Gianni Rabati, Panzer Jim, Alpa Ahola, Lordle, Hans, Chris, Jordan Troy, Jihad Gandalf, Aeophil, Lucas Likeson Ring, The Hog Shotgun, Bjorn Richter, Grady Peters, Patrick Finn, Nemesis 88, Mike and Johnny Secret Pod, Emil Flinch, Panzer Wagenleid, Brand Atlas 1902, Dustin Stratton, Tyler Yoshida, What Next, Heinz Haber, Pax Tibi Marseille, Zuma Historian is the Best, Pat Mike, Genesis Vice, Ace Gunner, Martin Harkinson, John Sonkley, Scar, Chronic Military Collector, Jan Kalivoda, Herwig Holger, Toons Tierney, Gerald Lorenz, Devin Lay, Henry Ramdas Jr., Adam Croucher, Malvin Cade, Pooper, Uga Booga, Colin Maloney, Zan, North, Ibby, Avery Moller, Varangi and Guard, Kirk Weaver, Hendrik Mueller, John Shelton, Surfer Dude, Dakota Rosson, Micah Holly, Edelman, Random Person 24, D, Gertz, No Name 325, Sinful Hero, Agent, Pragmatic Culture, W. Justin Walls, Mortales, Sebastian, Andy, Matthew Bragdon, Jalil, Alex FF, Quinton Lewis, Sam W, Scotty Hode, Hail Mary, Luther Bryanson, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, Vet Exempt, Automat 762X39, Monsoir Mercier, Charlie Black, Will from Florida, History by Grayscale, Friendly Fash, Jonathan S. Marinsky, Demetrius Laquan Fauci, Christian, Arminius' Revenge, Many Monies X, Gerd von Rundstedt's 14 Inch Turds, The Wooler, Suma Klubiek, Jorgen 1997, Admiral Kempinski, Carl Jung, James Ferris, Anna Paula Gomez Coelho, Pavement at 86, Kurt Alinde, The Glorious Lion, Omega, Kirk Panzer, Final, Son of Tiamat, Luke, Shifty Sheriff 2, Gerard Gerard, and Aberration, 